Good afternoon, everybody, and I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us for those few minutes. Uh, the lecture is an introduction to Islam, and I want to just start you off with the greetings of peace, the greetings of Jesus in the upper room when he entered to his disciples and said, Peace be unto you. So peace be unto you all. My name is Shakir Al Sayed. I am the Imam of Dar Hijra Islamic Center from Falls Church, and I will be your host today. I want to just start off by saying that as Americans, we all need to talk about the obvious. There's a lot of back talk about Islam and about Muslims and about how threatening they could be to our nation and all of that. So at least taking a few minutes to hear not about us Muslims, but to hear from us is a courtesy that we think it will help all of us understand each other. This is intended to be a family meeting, a round table discussion. So I'll just open up and take some questions from all of you. Just to start, because of the language and cultural barriers, I want to give you some introduction, okay? The word Islam definitely is not an English word. So we have to go to the language it belongs to to understand what Islam really is, okay? In the language which is Arabic, Islam means submission. While submission is a term that is a little bit uncomfortable for Western liberated free people, but when it comes to submitting to God, we think we can all agree that this is something that is not for anything but our own interest. If we believe he had created us, we believe that he had the right to tell us what to do with the life he gave us. And this is not something strange for Christians or Jews in particular. Prophet Abraham was told by God to take his wife Hagar and move her all the way down to the desert of Mecca. And he left her with his, her baby son Ishmael and uh, went back to Palestine. And he didn't hesitate to submit to this kind of very strange uh, order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he knew that he had to face his father, who was an idol maker, Abraham did not hesitate to face up with his father and tell him, this is not the gods that we should be worshipping. We should be worshipping the creator and the creator alone. So again, submission. When he was told to even slay his own son, he did not hesitate either. So what is the high mark of Abraham's life? It was submission after submission after submission. The same thing is for Moses and Jesus. They both, like all other prophets, were in full compliance and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the Arabic word for the Creator. It is the proper name of God in the Arabic language. And Allah also is the same name that God gets from Arab Christians and Arab Jews. They call him Allah. So on that end, I think that we are sort of in agreement as to who the Creator is what his proper name is. <coughs> of course, there are names used in English that we are all familiar with, but it does not change the fact that where those religions or those prophets came up, the, the name of God has always been Allah until today. Those who speak other languages, they call him other names, like in America we call Allah God, in uh, other languages they call him Zeus in Italy, and so on and so forth. So. This should not be a real subject of, uh, or an issue because Arab Christians, Muslims, and Jews call him one and the same. So the name should not be a barrier for us. And if you don't like the name, we can call him the Creator and leave it at that. But at least someone who created us gave us life. And we should also agree, I believe, to his authority. Being the Creator, God has the authority to tell us what to do with the gift of life he has given us. And uh, to just share some example of the submission of Moses 
and Jesus, one needs not to go far more than when, when uh, Moses was told to go to Pharaoh and he was afraid and he said, God, I'm afraid this guy's a tyrant and he's going to do everything to us. He said, don't fear, trust me. I will be there with you. I hear and I see. And Moses took the risk for his life because he submitted to the order and the will of his creator. This is something that we should cherish as something we share in all of our faith traditions. We also understand that Jesus himself, when he was being pursued and when he was being arrested by the Roman soldiers, he went little further in the room and in the garden and he fell on his face and he prayed. In his prayer, he asked God for something. He said, if you would take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. This is what is regarded by Muslims as an epic submission. You know that your neck is on the line and you still are asking God to protect you, but you're submitting to whatever will he would decree upon you. This is something we should all cherish, the joint concept of submission. So what do we get by submitting to God? What we get is peace of mind between us and our Creator. And when we all submit to God, we all can lead a peaceful life together because we all submit to one will and one source of guidance and one judge and we will go in one direction in which at least what God tells me from the Bible, the Old Testament and from the Quran as humans Allah tells us and cooperate in matters of goodness and righteousness and do not cooperate in matters of aggression or injustice. This is a very good rule of thumb that we can all agree to. It is not a big deal for all humans to agree to submit to God. And beyond the basic concept of submission comes the concept of peace. Peace in the family because the man is not a Heracles macho controlling figure. The man is a servant for his family. The man is a guide. The man is a, 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 a person who is responsible before God and before the society as to how he leads his family into positive directions and how, serve, how he serves his, their needs. Uh, also, Islam, Christianity and Judaism uh, do agree on several things, not only the concept of peace and submission, but on the principle of belonging to one God. We are not each other's property. We are not. So in enslaving each other is prohibited. <laughs> Manipulating each other is prohibited. Killing each other is prohibited. Uh, exploiting each other is prohibited, both in Islam, in Christianity, and in Judaism. So there is a lot to agree upon as far as living together on this earth, whether you follow Moses or you follow Jesus or you follow Muhammad, if you agree with your neighbor, then everybody can live in peace with each other. In fact, to secure this issue in particular, the Quran makes it very clear for Muslims, let there be no compulsion in religion, which means there is no way that anyone should use force or coercion or even temptation or manipulation to force or coerce someone directly or indirectly to change their faith. There's no allowance for this in Islam. And I believe Christianity and Judaism also would agree to the same. Uh, also, God tells us Muslims in the Quran, if God had willed it, he would have made the whole of humanity one community in one direction on one path. But his will was different. His will was to give each individual 
his or her own freedom of choice so that they choose to believe in God or not to believe in God. And even if you believe, you have the freedom to obey or disobey. Only God will hold you accountable for your compliance with his order. For your own pursuit of truth is what hinges between you and God. And it is very individualistic. We have Ibrahim, his father was an idol maker. We have Pharaoh, whose wife was a believer. We have Lot, whose wife was a disbeliever. We have Noah, whose wife was a disbeliever. And these are prophets. These are prophets. So I believe we should live the way prophets used to live. To live and let live. Believe and let others also choose their belief. Then what happens? What happens is we are all going back to God. And this is what the Quran says. You will all come back to us. And we will judge between you in matters in which you differed. So we shouldn't fight all the battles down here. We should not fight every battle right here. It doesn't mean that Islam is not for freedom, for which sometimes you have to fight. You have to fight for your freedom if somebody wants to take it away from you because it's a God-given gift. Nobody should take it away from you. It, nobody should take away your liberty to pursue life the way you see fit unless it will contradict with God's guidance, unless it contradicts with God's law. Then what is our role? It is to in, entice each other, encourage each other to do what is good and to forbid and prohibit and denounce what is wrong. This is an issue that we can have a discussion over as to what are the limits of freedom. Because there is no such a thing in life to call absolute freedom. Basically for two basic reasons. Number one, our faculties and skills and abilities are limited by nature of our physical creatures. We are physical creatures, we move in bodies, and we move in places and times, and we move with others. So our freedom always will have to be limited somehow, okay? But at the same time, there are basic freedoms that nobody should infringe on, one of which is the freedom of belief and the freedom of practicing your belief. I want to just caution everybody here that <clears throat> Islam is not Muslims. I want to repeat this. Islam is not Muslims and Muslims are not Islam. Like you could say, Christianity is not Christians, right? Christianity is what you learn from Jesus, what you learn from the Bible. Right? So whether a Christian goes out to kill or maim or harass or do anything wrong, it does not stand for true teachings of Jesus Christ. So I am not going to be willing or able to explain away what Muslims do in this country or this community or this place. Because literally speaking, there is not a single place on earth that applies neither full Christianity, full Judaism, or full Islam. So if you want to discuss Islam, then we need to define where is Islam that I need to discuss. Islam came to Muslims and to everybody else in the form of revelation that came from God through Angel Jibreel to Prophet Muhammad. So Islam is reserved in the book of the Quran and in the traditions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and also in the traditions of other prophets as well. Okay, so when the Quran came to the Prophet, unlike many other revelations that came before, it was written right there and then. It was written as he was receiving the revelation. He would gather the scribes, people who could read and write, and he would tell them, this is Quran, and he would dictate it for them. And after they had finished, they he would review it with them to make sure that what he got 
is what they got and what they got is what he told them so the Quran came over 23 years of uh, revelation that is his life as a prophet and he lived until he became 63 years old so it was about 23 years after 40 and in the last year he himself was reviewing the uh, the Quran with Angel Jibreel once every year whatever portion that was sent down to him he would review that whole portion with Angel Jibreel also to make sure that what he got is what the angel gave him in the last year he reviewed it twice with the angel Jibreel in the last month of Ramadan of his life Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a man who was known well before he was commissioned as a prophet for being the honest and the trustworthy the honest and the trustworthy even though up to the degree that his enemies those who did not believe in him those who were persecuting him and his followers when they had a trip and they want to leave their valuables with someone they would leave it with him they would leave it with him so he was the most trustworthy person in his community he lived his young life as a shepherd uh, raising and grazing the sheep of his uncle abu talib and uh, he also worked in trade in business in the business of his wife, the first wife, Khadija. And he was a person with so much integrity that people would trade with him. In those days, there were no currency and cash except gold and silver. And people used not to carry that much of those when they travel because they used commodity trade. So it was direct like, you know, uh, grapes for dates or dates for uh, corn, things like this or wheat so they had those commodities Prophet Muhammad was one of those merchants who would be able to buy anything with his name and pay it off either immediately or soon after he gets back home everybody trusted him in every way and this trust was what he actually used uh, when he was first commissioned he climbed a little hill around the Kaaba in Mecca and he called on his people the community and he asked them some question he said have you ever seen me lying have you ever heard me say a single lie in my life and they said no he said so if I were to tell you that an army is coming to attack you from behind this hill would you not believe me they said we would then Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said let me now t it declare it for you I am a prophet I have been commissioned by God Angel Gabriel came to me and gave me this revelation and they started to shout at him including some of his close relatives because they didn't like what he was preaching privately up until that moment which is the moment when he went public with his call so the the reality is he trusted how much they trusted him that he relied on their trust to establish his credibility as a prophet uh, if you go away a little bit from the environment of arabia and and come back to the text of the quran the quran is a message not for the arabs and it is not for the middle east as Jesus received the message in his language Prophet Muhammad received the message in his language and Moses received the message in his language the language of his community but does this mean that Jesus message was meant only to save his immediate language speaking audience or to anyone who would receive it all prophets were open to receive anyone who would receive them to embrace anyone who would believe and follow so the language of the Quran doesn't necessarily mean that the Quran is meant for the Arabs if you read the Quran you find God talking to all humans all mankind God talking to the believers all uh, believers all you who believe God talking to women of the Prophet Ya Nisa and Nabi all women of the Prophet God 
talking to every human who would listen. Even the Quran was listened to by the jinnis, and they were part of the believing community from early times in the early revelations, which happened to be in Mecca. Now I want to move a little bit to get closer to where we are today. <coughs> the Prophet, peace be upon him, lived with his community in Mecca 13 years of constant persecution. 13 years. In those 13 years, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his community were told, keep your hands to yourself. Do not fight back. Keep your hands to yourself. What was happening to them? They were fought and sanctioned in business. Uh, their community wouldn't marry any one of them. They considered them to have been labeled as apostates, including Prophet Muhammad, because he is not worshiping the idols that the community set inside the Holy Kaaba. And uh, all of this was not short of some of them getting killed just because of their new faith. Uh, slaves, when slaves were prevalent in those days, they substituted the work agreement that you have with your employer. But there's th those slaves, they were persecuted the most. So much so that rich Muslims who would accept Islam would have to buy the freedom and set free those slaves so that they can worship the way they want. And those that could not be bought out and those who could not protect themselves because they were not from a big tribe or big clan to be protected, they had to flee. So the first migration from Mecca was sent to Abyssinia where there was a Christian king, King Nagus of Ethiopia at that time called Al-Habasha. And he received them well and he asked them, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about Mary? Because the Quran spoke on those issues. The Quran was not silent on other faith traditions. So when they read the Quran for him, he said, you have said nothing more or less than what I have about Jesus. When they read Surah uh, Maryam, chapter 19 in the Quran, which has the story of the conception, the immaculate conception, of Jesus and how Mary dealt with the situation and how she dealt with the very, very bad accusations that were leveled against her. And uh, God made Jesus speak in the cradle as a baby. When she was carrying him and she went back to her community, they asked her, what is this? How could you do this, Mariam? Because Mariam is the Arabic name for Mary. So how did you do this? And she pointed to the baby Jesus and he spoke. He said, I am the servant of Allah. He made me a prophet and he made me kind to my mother and not overbearing or miserable. So the people who received this news, they embraced her. But others who didn't want to believe, they thought this is a work of magic or there is something wrong with this lady and this child and so on and so forth. So Muslims would have never believed in Jesus or known him were it not for the Quran giving us the story of his immaculate conception, the miracle of his creation, or the Quran had spoken about his message, his mission, his works, his ministry, his preaching, the Quran told us all of that. And the chapter in which that story is told, it's told actually in two chapters. The chapter that I just cited was number 19. The title of that chapter is Mary, which gives us the story of Mary as a central story in that chapter. With it also comes the story of John the Baptist and his father, Zechariah. So the Quran is full of stories of Israelite prophets. We do not hate or despise those prophets or their communities. In fact, it is rather the opposite. Muslims are required to believe and honor those prophets and their communities as they honor their own. This is the teachings of Islam. This is the teaching of the Quran. 
I will just cite a couple of citations. Uh, I think it is chapter number 67, Surah Al-Mumtahana, uh, where it says, God does not forbid you from being kind, courteous, and respectful to those who have not fought you for your religion and have not supported others who fought you for your religion. God rather forbids you from giving political allegiance and support to those who fought you in religion and are fighting you in religion or because of your religion or giving them commitment to support them in their aggression. I believe the Quran is very, very rational. Who would support an enemy that attacks Washington? If you live in Washington, you better stand up and defend, right? And you should never give allegiance to the enemies of your community. That's a basic common sense. On that note, on that note, and after 13 years of full and total persecution, Muslims started to migrate. The third migration uh, from Mecca went to Al Medina, which is known today as Al Medina, north of Mecca in Saudi Arabia today. And when they went there, they started to form a community. After a few years, the Prophet joined them. And when he joined them, they started to form a community of the faithful alongside other communities. There were a, a contingent of Jewish community tribes that left Palestine and came to Medina, expecting the next prophet to come in Medina. So they thought that the next coming prophet would come from within the Jewish lineage, the Israelite lineage. So everybody pulled their tribe forward and came down to Medina to expect that my tribe will get the next prophet. No, his tribe is going to get. So they came and settled there. When the prophet went there, he established what is known as the Covenant of Medina. The Covenant of Medina is, is a community and political agreement in which it became like a pact of service for the whole community. Anyone poor, we will all help him. Anyone who is wronged, we will stand with him. Anyone who violates this kind of agreement, we will all stand against him. So I'm giving you a very brief summary of a very lengthy agreement that constitutional scholars would call it the first constitution on earth. The first constitution on earth. That's 1400 years that sets limits. It says the Jews are a community by themselves in Medina and they are part of the community of Medina. They are not to be hurt in their faith, in their practice, in their business, in their money, or their family, or anything else. They are not to be hurt because what they believe or what they worship, and they ought to be protected. The same was given even to Arabs who choose not to believe that they are part of the community of Medina, and this pact is a pact of preservation of Medina for all its inhabitants. You could really find something like this short of the U.S. Constitution having being a document that must have learned, the founders must have learned from all other constitutions that preceded, including the Mithaq of Medina or the Covenant of Medina. We know that Thomas Jefferson had a copy of the Quran that he himself used to read. So I don't uh, have any qualm that the founding fathers of our nation would have learned both from the Quran and other sources, not only about Islam and Muslims, but about other traditions as well. These were very highly educated uh, group of people. So I believe that Islam, which is now treated as an alien and undesirable uh, newborn faith in America, has been here much longer than America has been here. Much longer than the Founding Father, the Constitution, and everything else. But at the same time, I believe that we need to talk and work around and separate between religion and politics. We know that religion has been used by politicians all throughout history, uh, well before Constantine, well before 
Augustine, well before anybody else, religion has always been used by politicians to capture the spiritual control over the community as they capture the political control over the nation they rule. And I believe Islam is not an exception. Islam and Muslims are no exception in that regard. We have Muslim rulers who exploit the faith of Islam to their own benefit and their own purposes. And we know that wars have been fought in Europe for decades, if not centuries, over the issue of denominations, division, and religion, and so on and so forth. So I would urge that our discussion focus on the faith itself. And here is a very brief snapshot of what Muslims believe in and what their lifestyle highlights are. Okay, Muslims believe in God, like Christians do believe in God, like Jews do believe in God. With the Jews, Muslims share the absolute monotheistic ardent approach to the unity of God. There is nothing like unto him. He has no partners. You cannot make an image of God. You cannot worship an object and call it uh, that it gets you closer to God. All of that in the Jewish tradition and in the Islamic tradition is prohibited. <coughs> So we share the same, excuse me, we share the same belief regarding God, that he is one, he is a unique one, he has no partners, he has no associates, and there is nothing like unto him. He is a stand-alone God, not part of or to be compared with his creatures, and not to be confused with his creatures as well. So people who worship their kings, like King Haile Selassie of Ethiopia was being worshipped and he liked it. There are other kings who have been worshipped as well. People also worshipped prophets because they thought we can't get to God with all of our sins. By the way, the idol worshippers in Mecca, when they were asked, why do you worship idols if you really believe in Allah? Because they believed in God. Then they, ask, they were asked, why do, you be, why do you worship those idols? They said, they get us closer to God because we are too sinful. We are too full of sins to approach God directly. So we have to go through something or someone who is either sinless or incapable of sin. So they used to make idols with their own hands. And they used to worship those idols, but they believed that their prayer is delivered to God. God condemned their worship and refused to accept it. God condemned their sacrifice and he refused to accept it. And he told them, if they ask you, O Muhammad, about me, I am so near. Let them come to me directly and I will receive them. This is the religion of Islam which is very consistent in this point with Judaism, okay? It is also consistent with Christianity in the fact that Christians also worship God the Creator. The only difference we have with Christianity is what crept into Christianity later on from the teachings of Paul and the, the, the other councils that developed later on the concept of Trinity and uh, yes. Actually, uh, Christians believe that in one God also, but it's three in one. That's what I was saying. I said we share the same with Christians, except for the fact that the Trinity started to creep into early Christianity 300 years after the departure of Jesus. There used to be an ardent Unitarian group of Christians whose center was in Alexandria, Egypt, led by a priest named Arius, who stood up for the unity of God and stood against the Trinitarian belief and the Council of Nicaea that established this as the faith of Christians and later on was uh, adapted into the Christian faith 
through the teachings of Paul that is spread all over his writings of the Bible. So the Quran tells us how to even talk with our Christian neighbors and friends and family. The Quran says, say, O people of the book, and the word people of the book is meant to say that we Muslims believe in the book that was given to Jesus. We believe in the revelation that was given to Moses. And because they have been combined in one book that we now know as the Bible, they are called together as people of the book. So sometimes you will read in the Quran the word people of the book that is referring to Christians, sometimes people of the book referring to the Jews, sometimes referring to both of them. So chapter 3, it says, Say, O Muhammad, say, O Muslim, to the people of the book, O people of the book, come with us into a common term, a common word between us and you that we worship none but God, that we erect not gods and patrons from among us ourselves and worship them. And if they refuse, say, we are witness, we are Muslims and you are our witness. We are in absolute submission to none but God and we will follow none and no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the message that Muslims have from the Quran to share with the people of the book. Another message, it says, and do not argue with the people of the book except in the best of ways, except in the best of manners, and say, we believe in God, and we believe, uh, say that Allah is our Lord and your Lord. The Creator is our Lord and your Lord. And say also that uh, we believe in what has been sent down unto us, which is the Quran, and unto you. Because the Quran is not sent just for Muslims, it's sent for humanity in general. Okay? So, this is a brief message. Argue not with the people of the book except in the best of manners. And say... Your Lord and our Lord, our Lord and your Lord is one, which is the Creator. And we believe in the book that has been sent down unto us and unto you. Okay? So this is the brief message of Islam. So Muslims believe in God in that context, with no equal, no partners, no associates, no competitors, no likes, no images, nothing to be worshipped in his place or alongside him. The second, we believe in the angels as creatures of God. We believe that they have roles in our lives, that Angel Gabriel and other angels have roles and responsibilities in our life. Part of the role is that they constantly praise God to encourage the chorus of praise coming from all humanity. So they are the leaders of all the creatures of God in the praise of God, in the uh, glorification of God. So this is one role. The second role is they pray for the believers. Number three, they support the believers. Like Angel Gabriel supported Mary to go through the process and made it easy for her to stand the process of the most difficult decision any woman would have gone through to accept to become pregnant by immaculate conception by the decree of God, by a word of God, to, to have a baby without having a man touch her, as she herself said. So, Angel Gabriel was there to support her. And when she was afraid of his presence in front of her, she said, I fear, I fear you. I hope you are not going to hurt me. He said, no, I am a messenger from your Lord. I am here to deliver you a message of a baby that you will carry. She said, how could I have a baby when, I, when no man has touched me? And he said, God so decreed, and so it will be, and will make him a sign and a prophet unto mankind. So this comforting words coming from God through the angel gave her the comfort and the courage. Uh, also, angels do work miracles in our daily life. You know, the last time you were about to have an accident, right? 
and you stopped at the last minute did you hear about a story of a young child four years old who was he was not she was not thrown she jumped off a window in the 14th floor in skyline towers you know skyline towers in Falls church virginia 14 floor jump and she fell on a bush and she was alive she's still alive until today who is carrying such a baby who is picking the dead from the living in the middle of the sea when a ship gets a wreck or drown who picks who who's going to live and who's going to die it's god what tools does he use he uses angels right so we know every day there are tornadoes hurricanes and other things and they pick and choose they don't destroy an entire community you see a house standing there a house standing here and in between total destruction so angels do the will of god all the time and that's how they are described in the quran so we believe in god we believe in the angels we believe in the prophets all the israelite prophets that were mentioned in the Quran and there, there are about 24 of them mentioned by name and others that were not mentioned by name that we do not know their names maybe some of them would be in the Bible in the Old Testament and maybe some we don't really know who they are or who they are not so we believe in the books and we believe that the last book of Revelation is the Quran as one scholar used to say if there is such a thing as the Old Testament and such a thing as the New Testament, there must be also a last testament, something that comes from God to finalize his message for humanity before the coming of the day of reckoning, that can talk to all humans, that can talk to all people, that can have the time and the, the application to let this message reach wherever humans are. So we believe in God, the angels, the books, the prophets, and we believe also in the day of judgment, that the day of judgment is real, and it is certainly coming, and it is going to be a day of reckoning. Everybody will stand accountability before God, and everybody will have their own book of records received by them, open for them to read right there and then. So no one will escape this accountability. No one. We believe that death is only a stage between this life and the next life. We believe that this life is so short and so limited to give it our whole. We have to use whatever God gives us in this life to pursue a good place and a good fate in the hereafter. People who focus only on this life, telling, you know, give me what I need today and don't worry about tomorrow, they are going to be facing very serious shock the day they die and the day they are resurrected and we are all going to be resurrected this life is so limited compared to the eternal life that we all have to live in we believe in uh, paradise as a land of rewards we believe in hellfire as a place of punishment may god save us all from hellfire and we believe that people who do righteous deeds in this life they will never lose unless unless they deliberately go against god if they deliberately go against god we do not judge them because we are told not to judge we are told not to judge we have no power to condemn or bless or reward anyone Muslims are told the only judge whose judgment is final and true is God. You could go to court, you could go to the best judge, but this judge could be deceived by evidence, by somebody being more articulate, more talkative, he can be deceived. But God the judge or the judge who is God cannot be deceived, not by anyone, not even by Satan. So this is what we believe in. What highlights the life of a Muslim is what is called the five pillars of Islam. 
The first pillar is the declaration of faith. If you believe in God, if you believe in Prophet Muhammad as the last and final messenger from God, then if that's in your heart and you believe it, you need to declare this so that you are known and incorporated and included in the community of the believers as someone who has certain rights. Those rights do not undermine the rights of those who do not believe. They also have rights and they are incorporated in our lives. They are part and parcel of our friendship, neighborhood, uh, civic society. They are part and parcel of us as a community and we are part and parcel of them. What is good for them is good for us and what's good for us should also be good for them. So the first one is the declaration of faith. What do you get as a declaration of faith? You can marry a Muslim girl because in Islam being the final religion and being the final revelation coming from God it does not allow a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim. And that's basically, we can, you can raise this issue in the question, but I'll just give you very briefly the fact that you can marry a, a, a Muslim. It is, it is okay for a Muslim man to marry a Christian or a Jew, but not an atheist, not a pagan, not an idol worshiper not a Satan worshiper. Why? Because those run away far from Islam. But for Christians and Jews, we have so much in common that a Muslim man marrying a Christian woman or a Jewish woman, he has her rights written in his book. So, sure. When, when he treats her well, it is not his magnanimity. It is his obligation. It is his obligation as a Muslim to protect her right, to protect her religion, to protect her faith, not to coerce, coerce her to change her faith. All of these are prohibited in Islam. Okay? So the first issue is declaration of the faith. The second is five time daily prayers. We know that all prophets prayed, right? We know that Abraham fell on his face and prayed. Moses fell on his face and prayed. Jesus fell on his face and prayed. Muslims fall on their face and pray. So Islam did not initiate something unusual for particularly the Jewish and Christian communities who believe in the Bible, who believe in Jesus, who believe in Moses. Uh, so the first, the first uh, second issue is the five time daily prayers. The third issue is fasting the month of Ramadan, fasting from dawn until sunset for 30 or 29 days, according to the lunar calendar. And that is mandatory on every Muslim. Exempted from it are children under age, exempted from this sick people, exempted from this, they can make it up later, uh, adult women, who are going through monthly bleeding or postpartum bleeding because their health cannot take all of this. So uh, likewise, they are exempted from prayer during their monthly period and they don't have to make it up later on because this would have been cumbersome to have to pray double prayers for seven or 10 days a month. So in prayer, they are exempted. In fasting, they are exempted with the provision they make it up later on, okay? So here is fasting, and fasting also was practiced by prophets uh, from the Israelite chain of prophets. Then comes the issue of almsgiving or zakah, which is to pay from your saving two and a half percent that is mandatory and due to go to the poor and the needy, the underprivileged, the unemployed, the handicapped, all of the people that we see around us. Imagine if two and a half percent of our national income is reserved or national savings is reserved for these people. It is much more than we offer in any social program that we offer even as we speak. Uh, the fifth pillar of Islam is Hajj or pilgrimage to the city of Mecca. 
it is mandatory on those who can afford it financially and go through it physically with help that's also allowed but if you cannot do it you are exempted and it is once in a lifetime it's once in a lifetime to trace back your roots as a Muslim to the time of Abraham the time of Ishmael his son the time of his wife Hajar at the time of the rebuilding the reconstruction of the cube called Al Kaaba and to to pay homage to the house of God and to celebrate the unity of all humanity under the roof of the protecting caring God so in Hajj you will see about two three million people from every corner of the earth coming together you see the white the black the brown the yellow all dressed men men at least are dressed in two white sheets to cover their body and they all go through one and the same ritual process together all at the same time and following like waves of people and it makes you feel your roots that go back not only to prophet muhammad and prophet ibrahim you see each other for the humans you are you see each other for the equals you are you see each other for the servants of god you are you see the unity of humanity in its best form where the elder is looking after the younger and the youth are looking after all and men are looking after women and everybody is happy to share in the festivities of the sacrifice that is done during that time and they all sleep in tents almost open to to the sky and they do not have any special privileges you see the sorry you see the king you know making tawaf next to everybody everybody else i'm sorry having flu <coughs> excuse me so you see people and you don't see the classes of course this is not true in our days because the the saudi kings they stand themselves out with special arrangement and fear of you know assassination or anything else they come with their soldiers so they stand out but everybody else they are all the same okay i think i will stop here i took a lot of your time and i want to thank you again for taking the time to be with us today and the floor is yours to ask any question thank you for being willing to share your faith with others i, sure. I, I applaud that and uh, i agree that you know we need i think that um, we need as a as a world and as a community to to understand where our differences are and where our similarities are and so that we can go forward and in, in, in the way that uh, <clears throat> pleases god and uh, you know, I think uh, there are some differences that we can talk about, and sure. I think that's important. Sure. Um, I have, I have one uh, question that I have sort of jotted down. Um, so, in in uh, Christians believe that a man, even though he's lived a life that is full of sin, if he accepts God, even on his last with his last breath. That he will be accepted into heaven. What is your what is your feeling on that? Same. Same. But not after seeing death coming unto him. Like for example, you have the example given in the Quran of Pharaoh. Only when Pharaoh was underwater, completely drowning, at that moment he said, Now I believe in the God of Moses and the God of the Israelites. We have the Quran answer him say, now, now after all of the miseries you have inflicted on everybody else. So we, we believe the same except when the person sees his own death and is overcome and overwhelmed by death, then he cannot make a U-turn. 
he cannot make a U-turn. Also, if the major signs of the Day of Judgment are set in, like the coming of Jesus is a major sign, if, if the sun sets from the e uh, in the east, which is the opposite, nobody's repentance will be acceptable. But anywhere before that, everybody's repentance will be accepted. But uh, just a quick, uh, I guess, to our friend. I mean, so to accept one God, but also accept the messengers and prophets of God, including Muhammad, right? Peace be upon them all. He is commenting that that uh, uh, the person cannot reconcile with God before death and continue to reject any one of his prophets. We know that Christians took exception, very serious exception, and they have the right to, when the Jews rejected, when some of the Jews, I would say, rejected Jesus. Because rejecting Jesus is like rejecting Moses. Rejecting Moses means rejecting all other prophets. Rejecting Ibrahim would amount to rejecting all other prophets. So in the same vein, rejecting Prophet Muhammad just because I do not know him or I don't want to believe in him or because he has been maligned badly in the media is not going to be, I believe, an acceptable excuse. But the, the excuse that Allah would accept for a person who doesn't believe at all in God, is if that person, let us say an atheist, he never received the message, whether the message of Jesus or Moses or Muhammad or any other message. He doesn't know anything different from what he has been raised to, to believe. So this one, the Quran says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ we would not put to punishment until and unless we had sent a messenger. So if the message reached somebody, then it is up to them to make a choice then. One choice is to reject it offhand. Another choice is to say, well, let me study this and then decide. Another choice is to say, oh, that's wonderful. I believe in it. I embrace it. Okay? So those three reactions are secured and guaranteed that Allah gives us this life to entertain those choices and to make up our mind, at least before we die. But I agree with the brother that uh, reconciling with God alone would not cut it if you knowingly reject one of his known prophets. Yes? I have a few questions. Sure. Um, in Christianity, there are different denominations, and some of the denominations, they really, they have some things in common, but a lot of them have very unique and different uh, beliefs. So is that the same in Islam? We have schools of thoughts, or you may say scholarly schools of jurisprudence, people who differ as to what the law is, okay, what, how to pray, or how to perform certain rituals in Hajj or anything like this. But there is no denominations in Islam in terms of the faith itself and the belief system. Yes, there is such a sect as the Shiites, right? And the majority, the rest of the Muslims who are following the teachings of the Prophet. But that sect, if you trace it back into history, you will find that it did not happen until the choice. I don't about the sex either, so I'm a little bit. <laughs> huh? You're teaching me on this. Go ahead. W wasn't this your question? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. So I hope I'm answering your question. So uh, if you trace it back, it goes back to the choice of the fourth caliph after the prophet. After the prophet died, a couple of his closest uh, followers and those who stood up with him from the beginning were the first two caliphs. And the third caliph was also very close. When it came to the fourth caliph, there was a chaotic turbulence inside the community. Some people raised uh, chaos and rumors and everything about the third caliph. 
and they created havoc in Medina and they stood until they killed the third caliph. When it came to the choice of the fourth caliph, some people said that the fourth caliph should be the young cousin of Prophet Muhammad, which is Imam Ali, which is a legitimate caliph after the Prophet, okay? But he came fourth in line after the three first successors of the Prophet. Some others said no, Muawiyah, one of the off, offsprings of uh, the Umayyad family, uh, a large family in Quraysh, uh, he ought to be the caliph because he defended Islam against the Romans in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, this area, which is called uh, Levan, and they deserve to, uh, he deserves to be the caliph. So this is a political difference that later on, the Shi'i sect developed and started to give religious justifications for, I'm sorry, religious justifications for, uh, that's okay, that's okay, don't worry about it. They, they started to give religious justifications as to why Ali should have been not only a successor, but the first successor of the Prophet by trying to do this to clock it into a religious uh, dispute instead of keeping it as a political issue, uh, they started to create religious materials and religious context around this issue. Thank you. So this is where the issue between Sunni and Shiites are. Uh, there is also another issue, and the, issue, the other issue is the issue of imamship. It's all about the leadership of the Muslim community. Who has the right to lead the community is always a political issue. And because Islam does not separate much uh, what is religious and what's political because the interests converge. You see, for example, today, our politicians are divided on issues in which the community is divided. The community is divided for free abortion at will or no abortion at all or abortion under certain circumstances. So our politicians are divided in the same way, okay? Uh, our communities are divided between those who believe that uh, anybody can do anything under any circumstances, absolute freedom, and some others who say, no, there are certain things that you cannot do. You cannot consume or sell drugs, right? But in California, you can, right? You cannot cross the border without being legally here. And in California, they think that illegal immigration should be allowed, like illegal drugs should be made legal. So politicians get divided according to the division of our community. Then they either act rationally and try to bring the community together, or they act irrationally and they themselves become divided and set our government into gridlocks. So I believe the difference between Sunni and Shia is started political, then it was cloaked into religious dress, then it became entrenched as a religious division. So yes. would you say that here is Islam, and then within the Islam there are this sect right here, and this, right here, this sect right here, thank you. But everybody else is just Islam. They don't have a sect. Well, I'm saying that more than 93% of Muslims uh, call themselves, let me say it, Sunni, which means following the Sunnah or the traditions of the Prophet. Okay? The, the rest, 8, 10%, they call themselves Shiites, which means they follow the Imam school of thoughts. Would you say that that is a um, uh, kind of like Jew, Jewish is like it's a religion and it's also like a ethnic thing. So yes. would Islam be the religion and then Muslim is the ethnic? Islam is a religion. The name of the religion is Islam, which is submission. But the Muslim is one who submits. So Muslim is those who follow Islam. A Muslim is a person who submits to God 
following the way of the Prophet. So you said that um, in the Quran there are several, you know, prophets the same as in the Bible, like um, yes, and that you all believe them. So in the Old Testament, at least, so so you believe that Muhammad was the last prophet of the Old Testament. No, Muhammad was not a prophet of the Old Testament, even though his name is mentioned in the Old Testament. This. Yes. Uh, I'm reading through that part right now. So. You, you are? Okay. So you go to the book of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon uh, chapter 5, verse 16. Read the Hebrew. Don't read the English. If you read the Hebrew, you will find his name. If you read the English, you will find the description of his character. Yes. 5.16. So I'd like to, to talk a little bit about something you, you said. Um, you said that Islam is, is not Muslims. You know, Christians are not Christianity. Yes. And I took that to believe that you know, just because you call yourself... I mean, Muslims obviously are the life of the is, Islam faith. That, that is very theoretical. But you, the, you know, and, and Christians keep the Christian faith alive. That is equally theoretical. But not all Christians practice Christianity. That is true. And not all Muslims comply with Islam. I think that's what you were getting at. Yes. I wanted to make sure. Yes. Yes. Anything that is done by human hands is always going to be imperfect. So, but I heard you say at one point that you believe that Muhammad was the last prophet of something. The last prophet of God. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, but you believe in the, like, um, Isaiah and Jude and Jeremiah. We believe in all the prophets whose names were captured in the Quran. 24 of them from the Old Testament. Okay? And those include, as I mentioned, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, uh, Moses, Jesus, David, Solomon, uh, Joshua, Noah, Jonah, Zechariah. All of these names are captured in the Quran. But the Quran itself says to the Prophet, some of these prophets that we have sent before you, we have told you their names, and some we have not. So we believe that all those who are mentioned in the Qur'an, it is a must for the Muslim to believe in them as well. Those who are not mentioned in the Qur'an, but mentioned, for example, in the Old Testament, we believe that they may be prophets, but we don't have the Qur'an confirmation to say they actually were or were not. So we don't reject any of them, we don't challenge any of them, but we are not required to believe in them. Okay. So you believe, like, my question was going to be, well, I think you mentioned Isaiah was written in the Quran, mentioned in the Quran. So would you believe, or, or any of the prophets, if they had written, like, the... Uh, Isaiah, is, Isaiah is a very celebrated uh, prophet in the Old Testament. And, uh, by the way, if, if you read Isaiah chapter 42, it helps you gain view of not only Prophet Muhammad, but the community in which he grew up. So, but my question is, so does, does that mean you believe in the Quran and you also believe in the books by these prophets? We believe in the books that were given to those respective prophets, uh, those that we have names for, but we also are told that because those books were not written directly by their prophets, nor were they dictated to their contemporaries by themselves, that they were subject to later documentations, which has resulted in some changes in the text of the Old Testament and likewise in the New Testament. Okay. 
Um, and you, I think it's very interesting that you believe in separation of politics and religion. Well, I, I didn't say I believe in separating politics and religion. I said Islam does not separate it much, but it shouldn't be used as a wedge. You know that politics and religion is always a popular public property. You see, physics, scientists talk about it. Medicine, doctors talk about it. Politics, everybody. Religion, everybody. So this is inseparable by the reality. But Islam differentiates between a political process and a religious process. In a religious process, you have certain things that you have to comply with. But in the arena of politics, you have more room for human innovation. Like, for example, if, if you compare the political systems running the Muslim countries today with a democracy, definitely you find that democracy is much closer to Islam than the system of tyranny. The Pharaonic system is not Islamic. The system of oppression, injustice, uh, all of these practices have nothing to do with Islam. It is all about monarchs and presidents who want to live like kings at the expense of the people. I believe humanity has crossed that bridge long time ago, except in the Muslim land. So I believe that politics have a place in religion, and religion has a say in politics, but humans have more say in politics than they have in terms of religion, except for understanding religion and how you practice your religion. Yes. So listening to everything that you've said so far, it seems to me like everything sort of goes along with Christianity in a lot of ways and the beliefs of pretty much peace and love with... In the values, of course, right. yes. But but the, I guess it comes down to the base, the main base thing of what Christianity stands on, which is that we re that as Christians you recognize Jesus as being God, and, yes. And you say that he's a prophet, but even as a prophet, do you all recognize that he did die on the cross or not? We are told in the Quran that the Jews who claimed to have crucified him have not actually crucified him, but they crucified someone that was made to look like him. And we can talk about this at length, but I believe, briefly said, we do not believe that the crucifixion of Jesus took place. We believe that it was a crucifixion that happened, but it was not him. And instead, God said in the Quran, Instead, God lifted him up to him. So he was ascended to God and he was saved from the, uh, the crucifixion. Uh, Jesus expected to be killed. He said, whatever they have done to Elias, they want to do to the Son of Man, talking about himself. They killed Elias. That's what he said. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed and asked Allah to take this cup away from him, he was referring to what? The punishment he was promised, which is crucifixion. And we believe that the prayers of prophets, and this is the irony here, the prayer of prophets will always be answered. He prayed to God to save him from the crucifixion. We say he is a prophet, but his prayer was answered. Christians say he was not only a prophet, but his prayer was not answered. He died on the cross. This is some irony that we can discuss at, uh, at length if we, if we can make the time for it. Uh, Mark Schreiber, maybe also add uh, the second coming of Jesus. Yeah, I mentioned this in the presentation, that he is coming before the Day of Judgment. So then, on this, what Christians believe, the third day he appeared, you were saying he was descended back from heaven? He will descend back from no, heaven. No, no, no. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so you're saying that the belief is that he was ascended up? He was ascended up to heaven, yes. Somebody else was. Yes. yes. But then how do they explain the third day where he re returned to earth? Everybody saw him and he was back 
after the crucifixion. Th this is the point that I'm saying. We, we, we need to discuss it at length. No, it will take time. But briefly, briefly said, you know that Mary Magdalene took oil to anoint him after the crucifixion. I'm, I'm reading the Bible now. Okay. And in the Jewish tradition, you do not anoint a dead person. So it looks like Mary Magdalene herself did not believe that he was long enough on the cross to die. So she expected him to be alive. And when she went to the grave, she was looking for a living Jesus, not a dead Jesus. And that raises questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, no, no, but, but that, you know, in my, in my heart, I don't, I think there's more than one way, one path, just like you said, there's more than one path to get to, to get to the promised land. And I think that for people to judge based on their beliefs, based on their differences to say on my right, my path is the right way, your path is wrong. Right. Definitely. Definitely, definitely, I believe that every believer who understands his or her faith, they certainly 100% believe that it is the way. And I cannot take this away from anybody. I'm not offended that a Christian says, this is the way. Because if he doesn't believe this, he would have been searching, where's the way? So I have to respect his belief and let him choose what he wants to choose and treat him for the family member he is within the family of humans and neighbors. Most Christians would agree that we're not here to judge Muslims on their belief in their way or Buddhists on their way yes. or Jews on their way. And I think that's you know part of what we have in common is that we all want peace and that's and I think, I feel strongly that the more that we can learn about our differences sure. and, our, and our similarities, the better chance that we have. Sure, I believe some long lasting and for. I believe going back to, I'm sorry for interruption. Are you finished? Okay. I believe that going back to the normal human family instincts, we are all children of Adam. We are not here because we wanted to. And we are not departing from here because we want to depart. Nobody wants to depart. So there is a, a hand that is bigger than ours. There is a will that's bigger than ours. So all what we need to do, I suggest, is to go back to the normal human family decency. That instead of I tolerating you, like I tolerate a disease because I have to, right? That I love you for the family member you are that I love you and I let you believe whatever you want to believe and live the way you feel peace. So long as I do not encroach on your rights and you don't encroach on mine, we will continue to be family. Do you know that the first fight in the human race was between two brothers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, one who thought that his brother did something wrong because his sacrifice was acceptable. <laughs> but that's not his doing. God accepted his sacrifice. You should accept what God accepts. But instead, he decided to kill his brother. So I believe we can either choose the path of Cain and Abel or choose the path of being the mature humanity that have been on earth for thousands of years. And we learned and we are much better educated today to reason with each other and let go, let go, let people choose what they feel peaceful with and share what you have. I'm willing to listen, I'm willing to learn. Yes. I have some more questions and um, I'm, I'm not meaning to get into a discussion, I'm just curious to see what you'll say. Mm -hmm. um, and you may have studied this you know, very extensively. So um, I've heard that, like, I don't know about all of the books in the Old Testament, but for example, 
the first five of the books of the Bible were written directly from Moses. And um, also, I, don't, I didn't look extensively into this, you may have, um, but I heard that like with the Dead Sea Scrolls and different um, um, copies of ancient, you know, things that have contributed to the Bible, they've been found pretty consistent from different versions. So, what would you say to that? Well, I believe that the, uh, the Old Testament covers uh, times that were way before, before Moses and way after his death. Uh, say that the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the first five books that are called five books of Moses, attributed to Moses, they cover periods that go way before Moses was created for him to write it, and way after he had died to write what was written after. But if he was a prophet and he was inspired, then the information must have come from God. You, you, can, you, can, you can extrapolate this, but when you read things that were way, way before him, he could not have dictated this. So in the Quran... Especially if you know that those books were written literally hundreds of years after Moses. The first documentation of the earliest writing of those five books came hundreds of years after Moses. So how could he have written them and whom did he written it to and where were they kept? The only solid stuff that Moses left with his people were the commandments. So because it wasn't in writing, that's, that's why the Islam is a little bit... Um... You know, when, when, something, when something is written hundreds of years after. Imagine, <coughs> imagine that George W. Bush is writing a document and saying this is the Constitution of the United States 200 years after the Founding Fathers. Well, just a second. If, I'm saying if this happened, how could we make Thomas Jefferson the writer of what George Bush writes? Likewise, let me give you an example from the New Testament, because this is closer and people are more familiar with the New Testament than the Old Testament. If you read the, the Gospel according to St. Luke, please have a seat, sister. Come here. So, Come here, Baba. So if you look at the, uh, the Gospel according to St. Luke, first verse, first chapter. Do you have your Bible? Uh, I do. Can you read it for us? It takes one minute. Luke was accompanying Paul. Until I understand. He was his doctor. The kids are allowed? Of course, of course. You said the first chapter? The first chapter, the first verse. What does Luke tell us? For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Complete. And the second verse goes on. Even as they, be, uh, even as they delivered them unto us, which are the beginning, where eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Complete. Again, complete. Continue, please. It seemed good to me also, having uh, had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, uh, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Okay. So. What do you get out of these three verses? Well, um, you know... What is Luke saying? Luke is unique among the Gospels because he is the only one that was not a disciple of Jesus that didn't... Matthew, Mark, uh, and John were all disciples, and so they, you know... 
Uh, but Luke was the doctor who accompanied the Apostle Paul. So he's saying that Paul, the eyewitness, is the one who passed down the information to him, or the eyewitnesses have passed down the information. And that's Paul was not an eyewitness. Paul was not an eyewitness. Well, that's why I'm thinking I shouldn't. Say no, but. Why. But the eyewitnesses have passed on this information and he's recording. To us, he's speaking in plural, to us, the community. So. Paul, uh, Luke was the last writer of the last gospel. And he is saying, you read it in verse number three, it seems good to me also, having understood or investigated the matter, to write to you an orderly account, dear Theophilus. Theophilus is one of his friends. So Luke is not saying, I am writing what God told me. Luke is saying, I am writing whatever I could reach of materials and I'm putting it in an orderly account. He is not claiming revelation. He is not even claiming inspiration. Do you see what I'm saying? But that's only one book out of, you know, 50 or 70, however many books there are. I mean, Revelation, John does claim a revelation for the, the last book that we consider which is the least credible reference according to Christian scholars. It's a dream. It's a dream. Well, um, how does God speak to prophets? He, he can speak through dreams or he can come in person through But anyway, that's a side point. I was just wondering what you... It's not a side point, but it is an issue that requires more time. Yeah, more time. I'm well, well interested in, in the discussion. I want to hear your views as well, but it will take us more time. Yeah. I have another question. Sure. Um, you, you believe in Adam and Eve and so forth. Yes. Um, then, and you believe in the fall of mankind? I believe in the sin that Adam committed. We do not believe that this particular sin has marred every human being there will ever be. We believe that every human being has his or her own sins to stand for. We don't need to inherit Adam's sins. We inherit Adam's nature, maybe, and we have inclinations similar to him because he's our father. So it may run in our genes, the inclination to lust, the inclination to make more money, the inclination to do things right, the inclination to do things wrong. We inherit all of those. So our sins are more than enough to add one more sin for Adam. So, so for those who do fall, let's say you're born and then you have the potential to sin. You don't necessarily, so what you're saying is that people don't necessarily inherit his sin and are automatically sinful. They sin, they have the chance to sin once they, or be good. We all humans are created with two inclinations. It's like one coin, two sides. Our souls have a righteous side and have a wicked side. And we use those when we need as we decide. So if I want to get your money, I will talk to you nicely. If I want to steal it, I will threaten you. Right? I can get your money both ways. But Allah tells me, I have to only get it when it is right and get it in the right way and get it if I deserve it, not if I want it. So the inclination for sinfulness or righteousness are equally present in our souls, every individual one. So we don't have to inherit a sin and we... Go ahead. Like you said, we inherit a tendency. We, we, we are created with those tendencies and we are guided to the righteous path and we are told about the wicked path so that we can avoid it. So we are given a choice. If we are, if we are sinning because of Adam, that means we cannot stand accountability. But I am sinning because of my choice. That's why I stand accountability. Um, but so do you believe in, in a Messiah? To, because for Christians, we believe that when Adam sinned, um, God said, okay, well, you know, 
you sinned, and the penalty for sin is death, so I'm going to provide somebody who will take that price for you, who will die on your behalf, so that you won't have to bear the penalty. Jeremiah the prophet, Ezekiel the prophet, they both said, no soul shall carry the sin of another. Don't promote this proverb in the land of Israel. The fathers have sinned and the children's teeth, the father have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. The soul that sins the same shall die. Individual responsibility. That's true. There is individual responsibility. But what I'm wondering is for those who have sinned, do you believe that they have the possibility to become right with God? Of course. I answered this question, yes. Yes. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh. Oh, okay. I missed it. I'm sorry. No, no. no. He, he asked it earlier if, if I believe what he said. And I said, yes, we believe in repentance. We believe in making up with God. And one of the conditions to make things right with God is if you have sinned against another human being, you have to also make it up for that human being. So I cannot steal your $1 million and leave you bankrupt and then say, tonight I repent to you, God, accept me. I have to pay you back. So you believe that making it right with the other person? Of course, it's a condition to be accepted by God. Okay, any other question? Yes. Um, I think many people have this question in mind and uh, many Christians I've talked to. They say that Jesus came and uh, there was no need to, uh, for another prophet to come. So as Muslims we believe that Prophet Muhammad came. But can you discuss why was it necessary for God to send a prophet? Well, basically, Jesus will tell us. I will let Jesus tell us. Jesus... Uh, you know, John the Baptist was asked before he was killed, are you the Christ? He said, no. Are you Elias? He said, no, I'm not Elias. Then they asked him, this, this was a group of selected lead rabbis of the synagogue, of the community. Okay? So they asked him because they wanted to verify where John the Baptist really stands. So he, he, they asked him, are you that prophet? Are you that prophet? And he also said no. And that's why they used those three questions as interrogation to verify if he is not one of those, then he must be a false prophet and false prophets ought to be killed according to the Old Testament. So they killed him as they killed his father. As Jesus tells us, they also killed Elias himself. He said, Elias has already come, but they didn't know him, meaning they didn't recognize him. They didn't believe him, okay? And they did to him what they want to do to the Son of Man, talking about himself. So Moses, on his deathbed, was talking to God, saying, whom should I leave these guys for after me? You want me to die? I'm willing to accept. But whom? What are you going to do with them? They are going to get lost again. They got lost under me. Right? So God told him, and this is found in Genesis 18.18. 18. He said, I will raise for them a prophet like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will come from among their brethren, meaning cousin, not their brothers, their brethren. And this is a word used for cousin. And he will speak all truth. And he will talk to them in my name. And he will declare for them things that are yet to come. So here is Moses. God telling him, I will send a prophet like you, Moses, right? Unto them from among their brethren. And I will speak to him. Uh, I'll put my word in his mouth. And he will speak to them full truth and all things to come. Okay. Jesus said, there are many things I would like to tell you, 
but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will tell you all truth. The same word used with Moses is used with Jesus. So Moses says, tell all is coming. Jesus says, I have so many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. You cannot stand them now. It is too much for you. You are not the generation that is ready to receive them. But I must go for the comforter to come. And when he comes, he will tell you all truth. So Moses says, tell all is coming. Jesus says, tell all is coming. Muhammad, when he came, he concluded his message with a verse in the Quran that says, Today I have completed your faith for you. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم Okay, so till all has come, which is Prophet Muhammad, who told us things that would have been very, very difficult to tell to the Jews of the time of Jesus or even the Jews of the time of Moses. So this is where things are. On another uh, direction, you could also see how many prophets have been killed before Isa. Right? The Quran says, without count, the Quran says, whenever a prophet came unto you and you don't like his message, you either kill or you belie. Okay? So, after the Israelite chain of prophets and many of them were killed, almost all of them contemporary to Jesus. And he was slated to be delivered to the Romans to get killed also, albeit crucifixion, which is the most miserable form of death, right? So, he himself told the Jews that he is the last of their own that will come. He is the last of his own that will ever come unto them. So he recognized the fact, like if you imagine God as someone who has a company and he's sending salespeople to market his message, his product, and whenever he sends one to this village, they get killed. The second, they get killed. The third, they get killed. The fourth is later to be killed. Do you think that a human being would be wise to send everybody following that in the same community? No, it wouldn't. If it is not wise for a human to do it, definitely the wisdom of God is greater than ours. So when the books that were given to Moses were written way after him by people who have never seen him, never heard him, the Torah, yes. And the same is true for the Bible. The same is true for the New Testament. It is written by people way after Jesus. The earliest is said to be 63 to 65 years after Jesus, right? And God wanted his final message at least to be kept. So he sends it first to a community and he will bar them from killing this prophet. God said to Prophet Muhammad, and Allah will protect you from people. And when this verse came down, Prophet Muhammad used to have a guard around his tent when he was in public, right? He opened the tent and he said to the guards, go home, I don't need you. Because God gave him the assurance and the insurance that nobody will kill him before his message is complete. And before a community that will carry this message forward to the rest of humanity is built. People try to kill him. Hmm? In Mecca, they tried to kill him in Mecca and he migrated from Mecca to Medina. And they tried to kill him in Medina also. Yeah, the attempts never abated. They tried to kill him also in Medina. So the whole point is two things happen in previous prophethood, which is the, uh, the, the, the changes in the books and the teachings. And the other thing is the, uh, the attempts on killing or actual killing of previous prophets 
who came all of them into the Jewish community as Israelite prophets from one and the same tribe or tribes and they knew them very well but when they decided that he doesn't fit the profile they killed them God said no they were true prophets and you killed them mistakenly this is wrong so God in his divine wisdom decided to send a prophet outside of this area altogether and with a community that is strong enough to carry the message forward and with a prophet whose life is protected until he had delivered the full message. Okay, any other? Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I'm obviously coming from a Christian perspective, but I believe that, you know, even around the time of Jesus, you know, the Jews had a lot of, they had all the prophets, they had, or, you know, that, um, they had a lot of wisdom as to when Jesus would be born, etc. But uh, even then, Jesus revealed it to three magi, you know, who were in another country. They, he revealed it to them that, you know, he would be born so that he, they could come. And then they didn't just reveal it to the leaders, they revealed it to the shepherds also. So God has a way of revealing things to different groups of people. Um, but, and, and again, I'm not trying to um, be controversial. I'm just curious to hear what you'll say. Um, you, you mentioned about Thomas Jefferson and how he, um, he's read, read different uh, books, including the um, Quran. Um, he was himself a Protestant, and part of the Declaration of Independence is that, you know, freedom of religion. Uh, and so, so evidently, I heard you incorrectly, and you believe that there should be a connection, but between religion and politics, but it shouldn't be a big deal, like that. I'm saying, I will repeat one more time: religion and politics are public positions for every human being in any society. Unlike science and medicine and mathematics and physics and astronomy, right? Everybody feels because politics affect everybody. Religious practices also affect people and their relationships. So being public property, you cannot sever people's interest in those two issues or using one for the other. Sometimes people use religion for politics. Sometimes they use politics for their own religious preferences. And this is a human tendency. You cannot change it. Some, some things are separate and yet they're connected to who you are. But like, for example, um, but anyway, the question that I'm trying to get at is, do you think, do you, do, do you think that the, like the Western or at least the American, uh, you know, freedom to choose your religion and how you worship or do you, do you agree with that or do you think that, um, you know, probably d different areas are going to be different too, but like some countries they choose to have a, a religion rule, the politics. What, what, uh, what do you think about that? Or the theocracy? Is it? Yes, like, well, um, I guess, um, Islamic legal system is a well, like, in Mexico, like in Mexico, like in Mexico, for example, it's, it's, there's it's heavy, the politics are heavily Catholic. Here, you know, Protestants they, they may have learned from other things, but it was the Protestants who wrote, you know, freedom for everyone. And then in South America, it's very Catholic. And then in the Middle East, obviously, there's a heavy Muslim influence. Do you think that there should be a religion in place or not? In place where? Uh, in I believe I believe this is up to the people if people believe strongly that God's word matters for them they will force it into politics and above politics and over politics if the majority of people do not believe that then it will not have a place and this is where we are. The United States severed religion from politics so that nobody will manipulate their political position
to leverage their religious preferences. And this comes from the European experience that prompted the mass migration from Europe to the United States. So we have to be cognizant of the context in which things happen. But let us say, for example, uh, let us say I come from Egypt and Egypt's majority people are Muslims and they want to rule their life, govern their life, socially, economically, family law, business, everything according to Islamic law. And we can talk about details of this as, as you wish, but, but not today, because it's very involving. But I would like to answer your question. Who is it that has the power to tell the Egyptian people don't? It is not in your interest. There should be no religion in politics. Who is it to tell the Vatican that there is no religion in politics? Who is it to tell Israel, mix no religion with your politics? Who? But when people agree to live where everybody, and by the way, Islam secures everybody's right. The Quran itself, in its text, it says, let the Christians judge by what has been sent down unto them, which is the Injil. What more do you have in any other system that gives you this kind of guarantee by name? It also says, why should the Jewish community members or leaders come to ask you, O Muhammad, for judgment when they have the Torah? Let them bring the Torah forward. Ask them, let you bring your own Torah. And he used to judge between them by their own Torah. We have the European experience has turned the West, and I'm sorry to be too general and too obvious or too blunt, has turned the West into what I would call religious phobia. We're so scared of religion that we've kicked God out of public life completely. This is not producing honest leaders of our community. This is not producing moral leaders in our communities. This is not producing honest business people in our community. Without God, we cannot police every human being ourselves. It has to come from our conscience. Our conscience is only connected with our faith in God. I agree, I agree with uh, most of that. But I also think that the government shouldn't have its position that you should follow Islamic law if I want to follow God's, you know, this path. Islam would forbid that. Islam would forbid that you, as a Christian, if I may, would be asked to follow Islam. I said the Quran says, let Christians judge by their Bible. There are places, places on earth that Christians are persecuted for their beliefs. And there are many more places where Muslims are persecuted. So let us not use the, the reality card because we know that the reality does not represent my true faith or your true faith. So, but I would, the point I was trying to get at is they're persecuted because the government has tried to enforce their will. On the Persecution is not limited to governments. Repression is. But to be persecuted, you don't have to have a government to persecute you. Your neighbors could persecute you. Yes. Can I have a question also, maybe a comment, like to add up on, on our um, friends here comments. So if I well understood the question of our, uh, our friend here, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah. Uh, so do they have the right to, as a bottom line, to use whatever laws or legal context to live within to, to, to any population of whatsoever in any place have the right to choose whatever set of legal um, uh, text or the text or legal system to use it to rule their own community 
as a standing point, I mean, as, as a starting point. You, you know that laws can be two types. Laws that pertain to your religious belief and practices, and those should have never been and should never be forced to change. The way I want to practice my faith, the way I want to uh, run the inheritance according to my religious belief, the way I want to run marriage and family law according to my belief, it should always be up to the religious group. That's Islam. But there are laws like traffic laws. We cannot make <laughs> traffic laws for each community. Yeah. Right? We cannot make a, a currency for each community. So there are things that apply to everybody being a member of the community or a citizen of the state. And there are things that are religiously based. Yeah. Those are separate and different. But maybe my question wasn't very clear. So, so it, maybe I want to rephrase it. I need to rephrase it again. So, um, let's say a group of people that chose to have a set of laws of the two categories, like religious and the other civil laws affiliated to their legal system. Do they have the right, if they vote in majority, to apply all these set of rules and regulations? To the community or not? Which community? community? Their community. So, so, so let me let me use the example I presented. So, you want Muslims? We are a minority here. I'm just asking a very general. Question. No, no. I'm so going to give an example yeah. to to make the, the 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 answer relative to your question. Or we are a Christian minority in Egypt. Okay. Do you want us to have the right to have our own currency? No, I'm saying... Do you want us to have our own traffic laws? Do you want us to have our own property laws? This is not my question. I'm sorry again. Let, let me rephrase it. Then I misunderstood your yeah. question. So let's say a community like in, in uh, Vietnam, for example, the whole society have voted in uh, a majority to a certain set of laws and regulations to be applied for the Vietnamese community, I mean, okay. the Vietnamese country. Okay. Do they have the right to apply this? Or of not? course. Exactly. Of course. So, so you think they have the right to? Of course. Okay, so if this law does not oppress any other minorities? Of course. Would you personally have a problem with this? No. Okay, so if it has... A it will concern me as it will concern many others so, so who care that? for the protection of minorities. How is the Islamic doctrine is protecting the minorities and how far is it from the actual life that we're living now? We addressed this issue before you came. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, maybe the question we addressed this issue before. We said that we said that uh, every, every reality yeah. has its own givens, okay? And we agreed also that Muslims or Christians or Jews or Buddhists are not a perfect representation of their faith. There are transgressions from all sides, okay? There are violations of their own laws. So if, if you're asking about a reality somewhere, then we need to address it. If you ask about the rule of Islam, we explained that Islam gives particularly Christians and Jews the right to judge and live according to their own book, and they should not be harmed for following their book. So in the, in the United States, we, we often say, I may not agree with you, but I'll fight for your right to say whatever your that is Islam. That is Islam. I always say, if the situation, which by the way is the current situation now in Palestine, if the situation in Palestine was the other way around, that Muslims are oppressing the Jews, or for that matter the Christians, and depriving them from worshipping in their own places, as it's happening today, 
Muslims around the area would have rallied against their Muslim neighbor to stop their oppression of other faith communities. The Quran says, so that I'm not making a political opinion, the Quran says, don't you be driven by your hatred or even disagreement with someone that you do not do justice unto them. Let not your hatred or disagreements with anyone drive you to do injustice against them. Any question? I'm sure we could go on for a long time. I enjoy it. How long do we have? I think we had two hours. So I believe it's time to release everybody back to your families. And I want to thank you very much for coming and thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I hope that something positive will come for our continuous meeting and continuous dialogue. I would uh, like to ask one final question if sure. I could. Like sure. So this was fantastic. I'd, I'd like to see more, more of this happening. So I'd, sure. I'd like to uh, add my name to a list of contacts. Sure. Uh, we appreciate it. Sure, we appreciate that uh, very much. Okay. Okay, do you have a sign on paper that they can? Okay. Any other question or this is the last? Okay, I have one question for the guests in particular and for everybody. What is it that I should have included that I didn't? And what it is that I included that I shouldn't have? I wasted your time with. Well, I felt quite left out because I'm Buddhist and you never addressed Buddhism. Yeah, I never addressed Buddhism. I never addressed Baha'ism. I never addressed Qadianism. I, never, I was not here to address all religions, but I do apologize. I, I did not intentionally do that. So it's not an exclusion. I presumed, which is mistaken, right, as you normally would, but uh, I apologize. I didn't mean to leave anybody out, but I didn't also plan to cover everybody there is. No, no, that's okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I liked how you kind of gave an overview about what Muslims believe. Some of the questions, and probably what took a lot of time, um, I especially, but um, generally speaking, Americans tend to be concerned about, oh, well, what's happening in the world, you know, are, are we really safe around Muslims? And so some of those, not, not you know, but generally speaking, a Westerner, because of um, a few jihadists, have um, you know, they're, they're concerned, well, what does this mean? If, does this represent Islam? And clearly, you know, it doesn't. So I think bringing that, putting world uh, perspective, world events, making that also a part of it, well, okay, there, there is a sect of Shiites and there's Sunni, and it's quite different what they believe. I think including that would, would just, you know, for current events. Um, sure. But I really liked how you overviewed what Muslims believe and stuff. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? You have? I was very enlightened just in the sense that, you know, you hear a lot of things, but if you don't really study it yourself, you really don't know. So therefore, have, you know, having the opportunity to ask questions and to hear other people's questions and, you know, just kind of take it all in has been very enlightening for me for the day. And sure. I appreciate the opportunity. We appreciate your coming. Thank you all very much and have a good afternoon, inshallah. Good evening.